Hello and welcome to tonight's book reading session of Preparing for the Day After, a picture ebook. Preparing for the Day After is a photojournalistic treatise on disaster mitigation published by me, Malini Shankar and Walter Keller for the 10th anniversary of the Asian Tsunami. Tonight we will finish the chapter on uh, bio shields for disaster mitigation. It is chapter 2020. Yeah. We finished interagency coordination. Water and sanitation is central to developmental discourse. Culture sensitive food security also has has evolved out of local agrometeorological conditions prevalent in an area. Livelihoods based on local agrometeorological conditions are the best means of ensuring livelihood security. Climate change adaptation, menstrual hygiene, especially for indigenous tribal women, solid waste management, universal health care access, sustainable development goals, they are all factors to be included in the development agenda. Media personnel have to be trained in reporting disaster preparedness or the lack of it at district level. Disaster is the impact of a calamity on the human landscape. This includes the impact on life, livelihoods, livestock, and landscape. Tonight we will finish the chapter on bio shields and its role in mitigating disasters. Continuing from where I left off last week, yes, food included lemon rice, curd rice, and tamarind rice. What we, what can we do, or what else could the state give us at such a time? And as there are no fish in the food aid, said Arasan. Only those who had built cement concrete houses on the sand strip that is in uh, Kilai, had lost their ho had their houses intact. Fisher folk hutments made of thatched roof were washed away without a trace. There were no sanitation facilities on the sand strip settlement, says Arasan. Now that the permanent houses have been constructed with cement concrete and tiled roofing, it is incredibly hot and uncomfortable, adds Sudhakar. We lived in shelters for six to eight months, adds Ramai, a 48-year-old woman fish vendor in MGR Titu new settlement in Kilai. She did not not get a permanent house as she had no documents to prove that she had owned property in the village that was washed out. We were so shocked that it took a whole year for us to restart fishing activities, Ramai added. No, there was no crime in the shelters, madam. There was nothing to steal. We had meager handouts like clothes only that all of our survivors shared in the cell shelters. What was there to steal then, said Sudhakar. Out of the 210 families that lived in MGR Titu old settlement, that was the sand strip which was washed away in the tsunami, only 160 got new houses on account of the fact that 50 families had no documentary ownership of the property. Ramai and Pushpa are two women who are now living in thatched roof hutments in the new settlement too. Pushpa Sauri Rajin had her husband and her husband have to live with her sister and sister's husband for want of housing. We got livelihood compensation like boats, oars, engines, craft and gear, but no monetary subsidies. I have to borrow money from the money lender every week to buy fish catch at 4 a.m. every day and start selling by 8 a.m. My sale goes on till 6 p.m. or till I recover the money invested earlier in the, in the day. And I have to repay the money to the money lender with interest. Hence, I have to I make no profit at all. Even daily expenses like clothing has to be sourced from borrowed money, says Ramai. Mangrove forests are one of the most pro productive and biodiverse wetlands on earth. Mangroves provide critical habitat for a diverse marine and terrestrial flora and fauna. Healthy mangrove forests are key to a healthy marine ecology. It acts as a breeding, nursing shelter or hiding ground for many marine living organisms. Many types of mollusks, crustaceans, which are different types of crabs and prawns, fishes, mostly young ones, mudskippers, reptiles, sea turtle and birds are seen, said Gladwin Asir in Tuticon. Indeed, mangroves are fest nests, fest net nests cut, retake. Indeed, mangroves are fest nests and nurseries for various endangered fauna. In India, mangrove forests nurture many endangered fauna like tigers, leopard, leopard cats, lynx, fishing cats, deer, jackals, wild boars, mongoose, pangolins, red squirrels, flying foxes, bats, and around 40, 400 native birds, crocodiles, snakes, including vipers, king cobras, crates, cobras, pythons, highly endangered frogs, in fact, Bithar Kanika, mangrove division in Orissa, in the Indian state of Orissa, is a herpetologist's paradise. There are also freshwater sharks, reef sharks, mudskippers, dolphins, turtles, many varieties of fish and squid that nest in the protection of mangrove nurtured coast. Given the frail livelihood security of vulnerable populace, it pays to nurture bio shields. The UNEP 
study called After the Tsunami Rapid Environmental Assessment recommends measures for reforestation and restoration of natural defenses. Urgent measures rehabilitate ecosystems. Lost and degraded protective ecosystems must be rehabilitate, rehabilitated as soon as possible with adequate coastal zone management proce processes. Many reefs are now covered with sediment and debris and may suffer more damage unless clean. Repair the infrastructure. The highest priority is to clean, repair and replace damaged environmental infrastructure such as water wells, sewage lines or water distribution systems. Clean up solid waste. The huge volume of debris piled up in the coastal zone by the backwash of the tsunami is a major cause for concern as some of the material is hazardous, example asbestos. Environmentally sound management of landfills, responsible recycling of materials and treatment of hazardous materials are all urgent need. All these efforts should utilize labor intensive work programs to provide maximum benefit to re-establishing people's livelihoods and be gender sensitive and focused on the special needs of the poorest. The time and effort required also offers an opportunity to apply concepts of integrated coastal management including public engagement in local decision making, employ rapid assessment and zoning and planning processes that will promote first the safe housing, second enhance ability of natural ecosystems to act as bio shields to protect people and livelihoods, third cost effective and innovative engineering solutions to control coastal erosion and fourth the use of best practices in placement of critical public and private infrastructure says the UNEP study. Assessing the damage to bio shields in the tsunami affected coasts of Sumatra and Indonesia the UNEP study cites a report by Wetlands International to say there were an estimated 100,000 hectares of coral reefs in the affected areas providing critical ecosystem functions. According to Wetlands International, coral reef ecosystems are found mainly in the waters of northern Aceh including Wei Island, Pulo Aceh Islands and the western waters of the Simulu and Banyak Islands in Indonesia that is near Sumatra. A scientific inventory of the distribution and status of coral reefs has never been carried out in Aceh largely due to limitations on secure access. The marine ecosystem in this area supports critically endangered leatherback and hawksbill sea turtle as well as endangered green sea turtle. Functionally, they also serve to trap coastal sediments and provide coastal protection from high waters. Highly productive seagrass beds totaling approximately 600 hectares are found off the coast of Nias and off Pulau Bay and Banyak Island. The seagrasses of the Pulau Aceh Islands are inhabited by dugongs, a speci species specific to the seagrass ecosystem. In Thailand, mangroves act as a living buffer or bio shields, preventing coastal erosion and damage to infrastructure and loss of life by reducing the force of the winds and waves passing through them, so that there is much less damage inland from these destructive forces of nature, says Alfredo Quato, executive director of the Man Mangrove Action Project in the USA. He told me this for in an interview for an IPS article, the link of which will appear here, uh, as well as uh, in the description box below this video. Quote, in Thailand, damage to the mangrove line coast up to a certain distance inland is documented. Evidence suggests that mangrove forests prevented further damage inland. The brunt of the wave force did not pass further inland and was seemingly dissipated by the first line of mangrove defense, he added. In Thailand, areas with mangrove cover like many beaches of Krabi, Trang and Satun were spared the wrath of the tsunami. However, beaches in Koh Phi Phi Island in Krabi, predictably without mangroves, were deluged. So were Phuket, Fangna, with the latter being severely affected, that is Fangna. Coral reefs suffer 10 to 80 percent on islands, western coasts, and, and 0 to 60 percent on eastern coasts. Mangrove deprived beaches of Frangna accounted for the destruction of turtle nests, resulting in the death of around 2,000 young hatchlings or eggs that the UNEP report has cited. The destruction of turtle hatchlings was attributed to the tsunami but caused in the first place by mangroves destruction due to anthropogenic factors. The affected areas had an impact on fisheries and tourism, thus affecting livelihood. Disaster mitigation could thus be very sustainably achieved through bio shield. It was proven. Reefs located in channels between islands 
suffered higher impact. Shallow water reefs are most affected. Deep water reefs and those around Phuket remain largely intact. Six to seven sites where over 50% of the reef was impacted may be close to tourism, four of which are located in Mu Ho Surin National Park. The tsunami impacted severely on the main economic sectors in the coastal provinces of the Andaman Sea, namely tourism, fisheries and agriculture. The livelihoods of well over 50,000 people have been directly affected. 13% of the coral reefs were affected according to the UNEP study. The grass bed along the Andaman coast of Thailand covers an area of 7,937 7, hectares, uh, says the study. 3.5% of the inspected areas of coral reefs are impacted through siltation and sand sedimentation, while 1.5% of the inspected areas suffer total habitat loss. The most impacted seagrass meadows are those of Yao Yai Island, Frangna province, which registered an estimated total habitat loss of 10%. UNEP assessments also reveal that seagrass meadows covering the intertidal zone appear to have prevented soil erosion of beaches during the tsunami event such as at Kuraburi, Frangna province. Mangrove forests help stabilize banks and protect reefs from terrestrial sediment. They are home to a rich diversity of marine and avian wildlife and provide shelter among their roots for juvenile reef fish. Mangroves also provide habitat for crocodile nests. The mangrove forests along the Andaman coast of Thailand cover an area of approximately 181,374 hectares. 306 hectares of mangrove forests have been impacted, representing less than 0.2% of their total area. Most of the damage is located in Frangna province with four stations reporting a total of 304 hectares affected. The remaining damage was reported at one station in Satun province where only 1.6 hectares was affected. This quote, the tsunami disaster heavily affected the infrastructure of the main economic sectors of the Andaman coast, in particular the tourism and the fishing industries. It also impacted the agricultural sector. The losses in these three sectors are estimated at 322 321 million US dollars, 43 million dollars and 0.65 million respectively. In 2000, in the year 2000, the total fish production in Thailand was estimated at 3.7 million metric tons with 31.7% of the total marine catch taken in the Andaman Sea valued at 1.1 billion US dollars. Following the tsunami, the fishing industry including coastal aquaculture suffered major losses in terms of fishing vessels, fishing gears, culture ponds, cages and shrimp hatcheries. In addition, eight harbors have been severely damaged. In the Maldives, there is very little documented information available on the mangroves of the Maldives. Mangrove habitats are not evenly distributed across the country. Southern atolls have more abundant and diverse mangrove areas than those in the north, with the northern atolls of Chabiani and Hadhalu providing the exception. A 1991 study by Untavale and Jaktap identified 13 species of mangroves and 6 species of other plants and 37 species of fungi associated with the mangrove habitat. A number of islands in the country have mangrove forms ranging from very small thickets to large pools. On many islands, the mangroves are closed and are found in island depressions that typically contain large quantities of humus. Other islands have uh, mangroves fringing brackish water regions. Although no large-scale damage to mangroves in the Maldives was reported as a result of the tsunami, initial field investigations identified a number of impacts on some islands including erosion of land around mangroves and damage to mangrove associated vegetation. These impacts can have implications for birds and other fauna residing within mangrove habitat. The health of mangrove ecosystems is also increasingly being recognized as a buffer against natural catastrophe. The major disaster risks facing the Maldives are related to climate change factors, storm surge, tsunamis and sea level rise. While tsunamis are extremely destructive as demonstrated by the current Asian tsunami disaster, they are also, unu they are also unusual events. The country has not been significantly affected by cyclones which often hit other areas of the Indian Ocean. As a consequence, the country has focused on what it has seen as its main risk, global warming and consequent rising sea level. Despite the moderate hazard risk, the vulnerability of the country is quite high due to its special geophysical characteristics that is, small and low-lying island ecosystems. The government of the Maldives should initiate an effort to, de to develop a national policy for disaster management. The disaster management roles and responsibilities 
activities of various ministries should be clearly delineated. A National Disaster Management Authority could function as a lead agency for disaster mitigation. Legal instruments for enforcing land use, planning and building codes are needed. Energy saving and other green designs should be taken into full account in the development of such legislation. Community emergency protection plans should be developed with guidance from relevant state authorities. Emergency shelters should be established on high ground. Technical and environmental guidance will be needed for appropriate shelter designs. The development processes aimed at social and economic improvement could generate significant new disaster risks. Major development programs and projects need to be reviewed for vulnerability and hazard and their potential impacts on the environment, unquote, says the UNEP study. In Seychelles, the tsunami that hit Seychelles on the 26th of December had traveled about 5,000 kilometers from the earthquake zone or the epicenter center offshore Sumatra in less than seven hours. By midday, an extremely low tide occurred through the granitic islands. At 1 p.m., waves ranging from 2.5 to 4 meters in height hit the east coast of Praslin and Mahe Islands. The effects were felt along the east coast of Mahe over a 30-minute period. Refracted waves hit the west coast of Praslin and Mahe between 30 minutes and 1 hour after the respective east coasts were hit. <coughs> Another wave occurred at 5 p.m. local time, followed by two smaller waves at 10 p.m. and at 5 a.m. on the 27th of December 2004, almost 27, 24 hours later. The second wave had more or less the same effect as the first because although smaller, it occurred at high tide. The two smaller waves caused damage only on the west coast of Praslin. The seawater surges caused by the waves flooded the low-lying areas of Mahe, Praslin and Aladige and caused widespread damage to beaches, coastal vegetation, roads, bridges, other infrastructure and houses. The flooding lasted for about six hours. Two people lost their lives. The tsunami was followed on 27th de December by extreme weather with rainfall reaching 250 millimeters in the northern and central areas of Mahe. Torrential rains continued for several days. Runoff from the hills formed virtual rivers that swept across the country, causing widespread landslides and tree and rock falls in the northern and central part of Mahe and in other areas with associated further damage to infrastructure, dwellings and vegetation on slope. The Republic of Seychelles comprises a group of 115 islands located in the western Indian Ocean between 4 and 11 degrees south of the equator. The land area covers 455 square kilometers. A total of 41 islands are granitic with the rugged topography rising to a maximum altitude of 905 meters, including the so-called inner islands of which Mahe, 155 square kilometers, Praslin, 38 square kilometers, and Ladige, 10 square kilometers, are the most socio-economically advanced. All the granitic islands are situated within a distance of 50 kilometers from Mahe. The rest of the islands are coralline, rising only a few meters above the sea level and scattered throughout the western Indian Ocean. More than 95% of the population of the 85,000 inhabitants in cons is concentrated on the inner islands of Mahe, that is 86%, Praslin 8%, and Ladige 2%. The population density on the three islands is 468 inhabitants per square kilometer. Preliminary assessments in five islands suggest that little direct damage was caused by the tsunami on coral reef habitats and that the majority of assessed reefs experienced less than 5% damage. However, damage was, a low part was low partly because of the extensive reef degradation from the 1998 El Nino estimated at 80 to 90 percent and only partial recovery since then. Many of the previously degraded reefs were particularly vulnerable to physical damage by the tsunami waves due to the weakened reef infrastructure and bio erosion but the general degree of prior degradation made assessment of the cause of damage unclear. Damage to the substrate was noted by the presence of scars where rocks and corals were torn off and in back reef areas by exposed rubble that was previously Previously covered by sand. Damage to corals was noted by broken branches of staghorn acropora and branching posilopora colonies and by damaged soft coral. In only a few cases, however, the extent of the damage was between 5 to 10 percent, with a minimum maximum of 27 percent at one site in the marine park at St. Anne. High damage at this site was likely due to the rubble framework degraded by the El Nino coral mortality. Damage to seagrass beds was similarly low, with only one definite case of damage recorded at Bai Tharnai Marine National Park, Mahe Island. In this case, a seagrass bed adjacent to drainage channel in the, in the reef was smothered by sediment, probably mobilized from the extensive shallows and reef flat area and backwashed from the land. Deposition occurred as sediment was being transported offshore by strong currents, says the UNEP study. Coastal erosion considered a major problem 
and threat to the human infrastructure along the coast. Chronic coastal erosion from wave impacts of tropical depression and cyclones has been identified at 25 major erosional hotspots. <clears throat> In some cases such as Mahe and Prahlin, erosion sensitive sites are retreating an average of between 1 and 3 meters per year. Coastal sand and coral mining in the Seychelles over the past two decades has exacerbated the problem. However, these practices are now much reduced due to the enforcement of the Removal of Sand and Gravel Act 1991 and the Environment Protection Act 1994. The effects of the tsunami and coastal erosion are clearly visible at both the exposed eastern side of the islands but also at the western side like the Anse Kerlin Beach section in the northwestern northwest of Praline. The refracting tsunami waves caused erosion of beach cliffs of more than 2.5 meters in places. The rehabilitation costs of this cost of this single eroding beach range from between 0.5 million dollars to 1.4 million US dollars depending on the type of protection option. It is believed that all erosion hotspots were impacted by the tsunami. Other coastal vegetation has been visibly impacted on at many locations. The severity of the impact has increased in the situations where the bordering beach and foreshore are narrow, either naturally or by previous erosion. The impact consists mostly of uprooted plants at the beach crest or exposed root systems. As most beach crests and coastal vegetation is salt tolerant, long-term impacts are not expected. The role of beach crests and coastal Vegetation was very important in reducing the impact of the tsunami wave due to sediment stabilization. The role of beach crests and coastal vegetation was very important in reducing the impact of the tsunami wave due to sediment stabilization, sand trapping and wave attenuation. The maintenance and extension of areas of mangroves and coastal vegetation is of importance to reduce the vulnerability of the coastal zone for erosion and impacts of calamitous events. It underscores the need for eco-restoration and sustainable development to mitigate disastrous impacts on livelihoods of vulnerable communities. The UNEP team members have observed that management of the coastal vegetation has been effective in reducing the impacts of the tsunami. Maintaining the health and extent of coastal vegetation is therefore important for mitigation of future hazards. The tsunami impact is recognized as only one part of a sequence of human and natural induced hazards and in particular coral reef damage was minimal in relation to the large catastrophic impacts of coral bleaching in 1997-98. Reports of other natural hazards occurring in the Seychelles in indicate significant additional threats to humans and to the island ecosystem. In Somalia, the tsunami resulted in the death of some 300 people and extensive destruction of shelters, houses and water sources as well as fishing care. The livelihoods of many people residing in towns and small villages along the Somalia coastline, particularly in the northern regions, were devastated. About 18,000 households were estimated to be directly affected and in need of urgent humanitarian assistance. The tsunami disaster coincided with the peak of the fishing season which increased the number of those affected. Although Somalia is not well endowed with natural resources that can be profitably marked internationally, it has ecosystems that are key to its social and economic development to meet the needs of the pop population. One of the major ecosystems includes mangroves which have high productivity levels as they receive nutrients from both the sea and land. Mangrove forests are home to a rich assortment of wildlife such as birds and many aquatic species but they also provide another crucial and often overlooked service to their ecosystems. They are a natural buffer that shelter coastal communities and wildlife from the brunt of storms and waves as such as tsunamis like storm surge, cyclones, floods that a littoral state like Somalia is naturally vulnerable to. The patches of mangroves in Somalia play a vital role in reducing shoreline erosion, says the UNEP study. Domestic and foreign demand for forest products is growing. The heavy dependence on wood for firewood and building materials with an increase in charge coal exposed to the Middle East has contributed to the destruction of the forests, woodlands, mangroves and the entire natural habitat in Somalia. Currently, there, were, there are very limited alternative energy sources." Somalia has excellent fringing and patches of coral reefs along the Gulf of Aden coastline and southern Somalia, Somalia near the Kenyan border which are highly biodiverse. The rock-like structure of coral reefs serve as a natural water break, a physical barrier near the ocean surface that breaks waves offshore and dissipates most of their force before they reach the land. Therefore, they have the capacity to create rigid wave resting structures that modify their physical environment. 
thus creating a wide variety of associated depositional movements. The coral reefs have suffered natural disturbances in the past, including those caused by the recent tsunami, that is the Asian tsunami. The tsunami could have reduced some of the coral reefs to rubble due to the cr crushing force of the waves. There could also be significant damage to the coral reefs as a result of land runoff of waste and pollutants, debris, soil and organic matter, particularly those near the coastal towns of Kismayo, Chisimayo and Mogadishu. Due to the absence of appropriate national institutions, there are no mechanisms to assess the damage to coral reefs by natural hydro hydrological related disasters and human activity and plans for their protection. An assessment of the coral reefs is therefore needed to determine the extent of damage caused by the tsunami and other natural disasters such as El Nino as well as general degradation arising from long years of pressure from human activities and management neglect. IUCN is working with local authorities and NGOs to monitor fisheries and establish a protected area in the Saad Ed Din Islands. Threats to bioshields such as mangroves, littoral forests, coral reefs, as well as forest cover are largely traceable to anthropogenic factors like development polemic, unsustainable economic growth models, overgrazing, unsustainable fisheries, aquaculture and trawler fishing, sand mining, illegal logging of mangroves, uh, conflict la in land use patterns account for decimation of green cover and generally unsustainable development. Alfredo Cuarto summarizes anthropogenic restoration of mangroves with the summary. He says, however, there are relatively few examples of successful long-term mangrove rehabilitation, partly more because most attempts have not corrected the problems which caused the mangrove loss in the first place. Besides, the need, the needed follow-up monitoring over a three to five year period needs to be part of any restoration plan in order to verify the long-term results. Moreover, the great majority of mangrove restoration attempts are merely hand plantings of a single species called Rhizophora or red mangrove forming mono culture plantations rather than truly restoring vibrant and biodiverse multi-species mangrove wetlands. Many plantings are not restoration but rather attempts of ecosystem conversion of natural mudflats to mangroves. In, so <coughs> In search of a compromise between assigned economic worth and biodiversity, Mangrove Action Project promotes the concept and practice of community-based ecological mangrove restoration. The, this holistic approach to mangrove restoration views the proposed plant and animal communities to be restored as part of a larger ecosystem connected with other ecological communities that have also functions to be protected or restored. Mangrove forests can self-repair or successfully undergo secondary succession if the normal tidal hydro hydrology is restored and if there is a ready source of mangrove seedlings or propagules from nearby stands that are accessible to reseed an area. CBEMR that means Community Based Ecological Mangrove Restoration focuses on re-establishing establishing the hydrology which will facilitate this natural regeneration process. It also engages local communities in the restoration process, empowering them to be stewards of their environment and enabling them to regain the livelihoods destroyed when the mangroves were destroyed. Best Practices Manifold environmental initiatives are necessary to sustain growth without growth becoming a recipe for disaster. In the book Strengthening Resilience in Post-Disaster Situations, Stories, Experience and Lessons from South Asia, published by Academic Foundation authors Julian Gonzalez and Priyanka Mohan, they have a watershed management is necessary for agricultural, environmental and social development. The physical and biological resources of watersheds provide goods and services to people including water protection, attenuation of disasters by regulating runoff, protection of coastal resources and fisheries, protection of the environment and protection of lowlands. Watershed management programs need to build on existing environmental initiatives. When located in flood plains, structures should be built to withstand flood damage to prevent water, flood water contamination and to avoid disruption to river courses, river banks and vegetation. Intensive agricultural activity should not be permitted on slopes greater than specified percentage reflecting land stability. Cl clear cutting of forests should be limited with forest conservation and sustainable forest management prioritized if we have to avoid Uttarakhand type of disasters. Institutional bodies such as river basins organizations should be formally established to address land use conflict and staff trained in conflict situation. Public participation of both men and women should be increased in management decisions. Effective 
Coastal management plans and enforcement of environmental and zoning regulation are critical and regional environmental impacts assessments are needed to ensure that cumulative impacts of economic activities are sustainable. Also, mangroves perform several other ecological and hydrological functions including water supply, erosion protection and habitats for fishes and other marine fauna. They are critical for the conservation of biological diversity. Go green is a simple mantra to mitigate hydrometeorological disasters. Deferring to the geomorphological factors to ensure habitat conservation and factoring in measures to mitigate disaster, the fallout of the calamity on the human landscape, be it lives or livelihoods, is the best way of overcoming disaster situations. That is all for tonight. Uh, this week we have finished the chapter on uh, bioshields for disaster mitigation. Hence, we will have a live interaction tomorrow, that is uh, 19th of March 2022, uh, around 7.30 p.m. Indian time. Till then, take care, keep smiling, stay home, stay safe. Ciao!